Well, hey, you guys. Here we are back once again doing another book review, my little Tomes of Terror show. So A.J. Wills um, is a English writer. And I guess, like, looking at his bio, he worked as a journalist for, like, 10 years or something like that, and then ended up becoming a full-time novelist in 2021, which I guess was his longtime dream or whatever. So, you know, that's, congratulations. That's, like, pretty awesome. Um, so I had actually heard his name before. And because of that, I guess I started to think, well, maybe I'd read some of his stuff. Because you guys know if you've, like, watched some of my book reviews, it's like sometimes I'll, like, start reading a book and being like, wait a minute, this like author's name sounds kind of familiar. And then I'm like, oh, duh, like I've already read something of theirs before because I read a lot and I kind of forget. So I thought that I had read some of his work before because I just had heard his name. But when I looked at some of his other novels, um, none of them really rang a bell. So I was like, okay, I guess not. Maybe I just heard somebody talking about him like on one of the book review things that I watch or whatever. But uh, as it turned out, his latest novel, which is called The Warning, uh, and it just came out in April of 2023. And it came up in my Kindle Unlimited recommendations. And I was kind of like in the mood for a good thriller. You know what I mean? Because I hadn't read one in a while. So I decided I was going to go ahead and pull the trigger on it. Um, now, it seems as though all of Will's novels, as far as I could determine, are... Uh, just thrillers like this and with kind of like a lot of twists and turns and this one is along those lines as well I believe he's also married to a woman that uh, also writes thrillers so that's kind of cool um, and this book, The Warning, it's like, I had a couple like tiny, small, like niggling issues with it, but overall this was like a pretty great, um, very gripping book. It was like a page turner for sure. Like I said, I usually read them like on my phone, like over my lunch hour and stuff. And I kept like wanting to get back to it. You know what I mean? So that's really good. Like I kept, I read it like really, really quick. You know what I mean? Because I kept wanting to go back to it and see what was going to happen. So the story of The Warning is told in the third person, but from just the sole perspective of this woman named Megan. I think in the British version, her name is Zoe, but I, just, I thought I saw that and I was like, okay, whatever. So about 10 months prior to the events of the novel, um, the house that belonged to her and her husband, Justin, burned down. I mean, it didn't completely burn down, but it was like, you know, pretty much essentially destroyed by fire. Like, I think it's still there, but it's all like, you know, fucked up and everything. Now, this fire killed the couple's two young sons, whose names were Felix and Sebastian. Now, the fire was ruled accidental, but it apparently happened after Megan drank too much one evening, took a sedative on top of that, and then evidently, like, went into the other room and, like, turned on a faulty heater. Like, they kind of knew that it wasn't working all that good and turned it on, and then that ended up, and then she fell asleep, and that ended up setting the curtains on fire, and then the flames kind of spread to the rest of the house, like, up into the kid's room, and they died of smoke inhalation. So, not surprisingly... Because of this, uh, Megan is just, like, inconsolable. So not only has she lost, obviously, the two most precious things in the world to her, her two children, but she also blames herself for killing her kids, you know what I mean? Which is fucking her up all, all kind of ways. And as if that isn't bad enough, like, the fire was kind of, like, a big deal. Like, in the media, so it was, like, in all the papers and on TV and everything like that. So now the public is largely blaming her, too. Like, you fell asleep and you killed your babies and it's, like, she's been getting death threats and, like, all this other kind of shit. So, you know, not helping her mental state. And also, you know, obviously, as would happen any kind of tragedy like this, um, her marriage to Justin is kind of strained. But it does seem as though, at least at first, um, that maybe their shared grief is kind of like bringing them closer together rather than driving them further apart. Now, Megan obviously suspects that Justin, you know, even if subconsciously, like blames her carelessness for the boy's deaths. But he does stay with her and he tries to be, you know, he tries to step up. He tries to be like really supportive and perfect for her and like be there for her and like give her space to heal and all this other kind of stuff. And Megan says many times, like at the beginning of the story, that she doesn't really know what she would have done without him. Like she needs him being there like as her support system. Now, because the couple's house was, like I said, it didn't burn down completely, but it was severely damaged by the fire, obviously, the pair have been staying in rental properties um, until they can kind of get an assessment on whether their house is going to be able to be, like, salvaged and rebuilt and how long that's going to take, like, if, you know, that is indeed the case. 
So um, Justin ends up telling Megan that he's like, you know, there's this remote cottage in Cornwall that I used to stay in over the summers with my family when I was growing up. And it became available for long-term rent. And Justin has so many pleasant memories of spending his summers there that he decides he's going to rent this house without really consulting Megan about it first. Um, He's kind of like figuring that, well, you know, getting away from the city and getting away from all the media scrutiny and everything like that will be good for us. And he's like, plus I have so many good memories at this place and I want to share that with you or whatever, even though she's not super jazzed about the idea. So the cottage is located kind of on this isolated, like a big estate called Trelor, Trelor, something like that. Um, And this is owned by this kind of like aristocratic family who are away in France most of the year. Like it's a whole like old school, like British aristocracy kind of deal where they have like the manor house and there's all this uh, like huge property and everything. Now, when Megan and Justin first get there, Megan is, um, let's call it less than enthusiastic, like, about this place. Like, the house is kind of, like, miles from any civilization, really. Um, you know, it's kind of dated. It hasn't really been kept up because no one's really been staying in it. So it's kind of, it's not trashed, but you know what I mean? It's kind of, like, shabby, you know? Um, and Justin is kind of, like, disappointed that Megan is not really, doesn't really seem to like it, like isn't really into it. And he's, so he kind of tries to cajole her into seeing how awesome it is, like seeing the potential and everything. And she kind of like tries to pretend that she's excited as he is because she doesn't want to let him down. There's that kind of thing going on too, where she just like wants to please him all the time. But um, he isn't really fooled and kind of knows that she's not really into the idea. And then, uh, to make matters worse, when they first get there, like, and Megan, this is the first time that she's seeing the place. When they go to explore the upstairs, they discover that someone has been squatting in this house. Like, they go up and in one of the bedrooms, they find, like, a sleeping bag and, like, food wrappers and, like, drink things. And, like, it kind of smells funky in there. Like, somebody's been, like, you know, it smells, like, sweaty. Like, somebody's been up in there, like, staying. Um, now it doesn't look like anyone has broken in, like none of the locks are broken, none of the windows are broken or anything like that. So however this person got in, they didn't break in and it doesn't look like anything's been taken or messed up or destroyed or anything like that, but it just looks like somebody has been staying in there. So Megan, uh, again, not surprisingly is so- super like not comfortable, like staying in this house until everything is like checked and cleared out and everything. She's like, you know, what if this squatter like decides to come back and I'm here by myself? It's like, it's not, like I said, very understandable. You don't really want, because it's obvious that someone has recently been staying in there and she's like, yeah, they could be coming back like any time. And I don't really like that idea. So she basically insists, she's like, okay, well, we're going to go stay in a hotel tonight while uh, the rental agent, whose name is Harriet, she gets the property overseer, like the guy that, you know, looks after the grounds in the house and everything, whose name is Colin. He's this grizzled old fart. Um, and he's going to come in and like clean everything out and make the place livable, make sure all the locks are still working and all of that jazz. Now, not too long after moving into this house, Justin has some kind of like emergency at work and this necessitates him being gone for several days. Now, Megan is just beside herself. Um, and she's actually like pretty resentful about this because Justin had actually promised, like this was his idea. And he had actually promised, I'm going to take the whole week off work. and I'm going to stay with you. And we're going to do like couple time and like reconnect. And, you know, and I want to ease you into this because he's like, because I know it's a big change and it's isolated and everything like that. And she's still, obviously, it's only been 10 months since her boys died so she's still not you know she's still very fragile and everything and she kind of needed him to lean on and he suddenly oh gotta go you know and he's just like gone all the time and she's just like stuck out here in this house that she doesn't even really like like by herself so there's that whole thing going on and there's also the issue of this possibly dangerous squatter who may or may not be back at any time so you know and she doesn't have any friends around or anything like that um now the only lifeline that she really has is Harriet, the rental agent, who is actually like pretty sympathetic and actually does befriend her. So she does have that, um, you know, like she gives her her phone number and she comes by like to check on her and everything like that. Um, But other than that, she's kind of a little bit, I don't know, like at sixes and sevens, I guess. She's just doesn't really know what to do with herself. And then one day when Megan is in this isolated, creepy house, like by herself, She hears a sound that resembles like an old cell phone ringing like somewhere in the cottage. 
So she searches, like, furiously all over the place, like, looking for where this noise is coming from. And she ends up finding this old, like, Nokia phone um, that still has a charge. And it's stashed up in the attic loft. So she's like, well, did this belong to the squatter or to a former tenant? Because like I said, this was like a summer rental cottage. Obviously, whoever's phone it is, it's been, they've been here recently because this still has a charge and, you know, the phone doesn't keep a charge that long. So she's kind of like, starts looking at the phone, like looking at the messages and stuff, like to see if she can figure out whose phone this is, so she can possibly return it or figure out what's going on. But instead, she finds a text in there that basically says don't trust your husband now at first obviously as you would she thinks well this message is directed at someone else right she's like this isn't my phone this isn't even really my house um so you know obviously this is to somebody else but as the texts still keep coming in uh one of them they eventually start referring to justin by name so she's kind of at this point forced to contend with the possibility that someone is either legitimately trying to warn her about something or is trying to like plant ideas in her head for some nefarious purpose that we don't know what it is yet now, previous to this, uh, Megan had really never had any reason to fear her husband. She um, didn't trust him completely because he had like cheated on her at one point, like um, a long time past. But the messages are really starting to get to her and like give her pause, you know what I mean? Because it's more than one, like they keep coming in. Another thing that's kind of causing her to doubt herself is that um, everybody else on the estate, like Colin, the overseer guy, and like the aristocratic family who owns the estate, like when they eventually come back uh, to the house, they kind of have seemingly um, hostile reactions to Justin uh, returning. Because remember, he spent fa summers there like as a, as a teenager. And so they all know him. They all like remember him. And uh, so obviously they don't remember him fondly though. Um, but when Megan tries to figure out, like, what it is that, you know, it's like, well, what's the matter? Like, why, you know, why do you guys, like, not like him? Or why do you talk about him like that? This, like, some of them don't really want to get into it. You know what I mean? So, and the thing about it, too, is that Justin really only told her about all the, the happy times that he had at this place, like, as a teenager. So she's like, what exactly is going on here? Because, like, there's some shit that he's probably not telling me. So as the story goes on, um, you know, the mystery starts getting deeper and deeper. Now, I, I, you know, I will say right here, this isn't really a spoiler, um, but, you know, potential readers, if you want to go into this completely blind, you may want to, like, skip ahead some. But like I said, this isn't necessarily a spoiler because it's a thriller, so you kind of know how it's going to go. Um, but it is fairly obvious uh, to the reader that Justin is hiding something. So, like, for a long time, you're not entirely sure what that is, though. Now, one thing that I will say, because remember I said that I had like a couple of small issues with it. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of these issues that I talked about earlier was that because you're seeing everything from Megan's point of view, it's pretty clear immediately um, that Megan is constantly making excuses for Justin's behavior, which is very, very controlling. Like he's constantly gaslighting her. He's constantly... Um, you know, thinking that he knows what's best for her when she is maybe like not, she's like, yeah, I don't think that's how, but you know, if that's what you think, you know what I mean? She's kind of like going along with it. Um, and this is like, a was a little bit like infuriating because it's, you know, it's very plain that Justin is like a big dick. He's a dick, but she just kind of like refuses to see it. She's always kind of like making excuses for him. Cause like I said, this is all, this is all from her point of view. So the things that she's thinking, it's like really infuriating because you're like, he's just clearly a jerk. I don't, I don't know why you can't see it. Um, I mean, this isn't really, okay. Like I called it an issue. I guess it's not really an issue per se because the way that her character is and a woman in a relationship like this, um, this is likely how they would think and behave in real life. So it's not like inaccurate. I'm just saying that. But um, sometimes like you're, when you're reading it though, like you just kind of want to slap her <laughs> and like tell her to get a fucking clue, you know, already. Because, you know, it's like I said, he's so just obviously like a douchebag. Um, 
Also, I have to say, like, she kind of makes some very, very dumb decisions, like, as the story progresses. But again, this is not surprising, like, given how long that she's been kind of, like, steadily undermined by this dude, like, over the, I think they've been in a relationship for, like, 12 years or something like that. So it's kind of, like, really kind of, like, chipped away at her self-esteem. And she's in a very vulnerable place right now because of the death of her kids and everything like that. Um, So it is kind of frustrating to read about sometimes though and i'm gonna say that it even though it's like uncharitable and you can under but you can understand like where she's coming from but i did still keep wishing that she would kind of like hurry up and grow a spine and like you know wake up and smell the coffee like pretty much and like see what what her husband was really like gonna say though that the story isn't quite as straightforward as it seems uh you know at first impression uh and so aj wills like the author he does throw in some curveballs that i didn't necessarily see coming i mean i did get in the ballpark but i didn't know exactly how it was gonna go so there's that the only other very small issues that i had with the book uh some of the peripheral characters that i thought were going to like play into the story more and they didn't really um, and I'm going to say like the slightly unbelievable, or I don't know about unbelievable, but kind of like over the top a little bit, you know, the, the kind of like plot stuff that was going on at the end. But the thing about it is like, I'm not going to like ding this book specifically for that because thrillers, that's kind of their whole thing. It's like, they usually have these crazy twists or like these outlandish kind of like plot things that happen like in the third act or whatever. So I kind of feel like that's just a thing that happens in the genre. And this one is actually like fairly restrained, I guess, like compared to some other stuff that I've read. So I'm not going to complain about that too much. Um, but overall, I did actually have a really great time with this book. Um, it and it hooked me right away. Um, you know, I got right into the story and I really kind of found myself like unable to put it down. Like I kept wanting to go back to it and stuff like that. It's not super long. It's about 400 pages, give or take. Um, and I read it like really, really quickly, like just over my lunch hours because I kept wanting to go back to it. Um, so even though I did find the character of Megan a little bit pitiful and like a little bit maddening at times because um, you just kind of wanted her to wake up, like I said. Um, but I still was rooting for her, even while I was reading it, and I was just, like, wishing that I could kind of, like, step through the pages and just, like, kick her up the ass and, like, get her ass moving, you know what I mean? So it was that kind of thing. But, like I said, I guess, th I guess that's good, because that was, like, a realistic character, like, given the situation that she was in. So I'm gonna say, like, if you're in the mood for just, like, a good classic style, like, domestic thriller, uh, you know, that has kind of like your requisite interesting twists and turns and stuff like that. Um, I found this a very quick, very compelling read. Like, it's nothing you haven't read before. Like, it's not reinventing the wheel, you know, like I usually say. But, you know, and it had a couple small negatives in the sense that I don't know how some people might respond to her character. Some people might find her character, like, too frustrating, uh, you know, to want to follow or, you know, uh, not really sympathize with, but I actually did sympathize with her, even though I wanted to smack her, like, sometimes. Um, but it is a very entertaining and very engrossing story, and if it sounds like your jam, then I would definitely recommend it. Like, I thought it was really good. So that will do it for this Tomes of Terror. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Please remember to like, share, subscribe, and all of that good stuff, and I'll see you guys again on the next one. Bye!